Today's reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 1 to 7. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over, without words, by the behaviour of their wives when they see the purity and the reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles or the wearing of gold, jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you in the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Hello Avenue. Well today we are back in the New Testament letter of 1 Peter and we were looking at that last term we took a break over Christmas so it'd be great if you had the letter of 1 Peter open in front of you and the passage we've just had read out to us is 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 to 7 Peter's instructions to Christian wives and husbands and as we turn to a passage like this we just need to remember something in the Bible whenever marriage is mentioned it is always deeply significant Marriage in the Bible is never seen as just a human transaction or a legal transaction or even the happy ending to a love story. No, marriage in the Bible always acts as a signpost to the eternal, passionate and committed love Jesus Christ has for his people, his bride, the church. Again, it's striking that the Bible begins and ends with a marriage. It begins with a marriage between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2. And it ends with that great marriage in eternity between Christ and the church in Revelation 21. So in the Bible, marriage is always pointing beyond itself to Christ's eternal, passionate and committed love for his people. And now to really begin to, to wrestle with and understand and rejoice in Christ-shaped marriage, I would urge anyone watching this to spend a bit of time reading the passage that Paul writes on marriage in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 to 33. Because there the Apostle Paul gives detailed teaching to both husbands and wives on how their married relationship together should point them both towards Christ's passionate love and service of his people. You see, at its best, the marriage between two Christians has both husband and wife learning from Jesus how to live a life of sacrificial submission on the part of the wife and how to live a life of sacrificial authority on the part of the husband. I'd really encourage anyone watching this to go to Ephesians 5 and see that picture. But the passage we're looking at today in 1 Peter chapter 3 begins with a situation in marriage that if you like is far from ideal. It's not marriage at its best. It can be marriage that actually in its experience can be painful. You see, Peter is writing to Christian wives in verses one to six of this passage who are married to husbands who don't believe, husbands who aren't themselves Christians. Look at verse one again for a moment. Wives, says Peter, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. And we might ask the question, well, why are these Christian women married to non-Christian husbands? I mean, the implication of the New Testament is clear that if Jesus is the Lord of your life, then you need a marriage partner for whom Jesus is also the Lord of their lives. Again, choosing to marry someone who doesn't believe that Jesus is Lord just will not help you live wholeheartedly for Jesus in this world. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, speaking to Christian widows, he says, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. So what's happened here? Why are these Christian wives married to husbands who don't believe? 
Well, that could be for any number of reasons. Perhaps a Christian woman had to enter into an arranged marriage with a non-Christian husband. Again, arranged marriages were very common in the first century world Peter's writing in. But most likely, I think Peter's writing to women who converted to Christianity after they were married. These women were already married when they heard the gospel of Jesus. And now, thanks to Jesus, well, their world has turned upside down. Again, before meeting Jesus, perhaps married life felt fairly settled and peaceful for these women. But then they heard the gospel. They were gripped by the love and grace of Jesus, the Son of God who loved them and gave himself for them. And in time, each of these wives confessed their need for forgiveness and they put their trust in Jesus for the whole of their lives. And it would have been a joyful moment for them. But then the problems would have begun. You see, while the wife had put her trust in Jesus, crucially, her husband didn't. The husbands of these women Peter's writing to aren't believers. Maybe they're just not interested in Christianity. Maybe they're downright hostile to what their wives now believe. Maybe they're just baffled by the women that their wives have suddenly become. As a result, the Christian wives here don't know what to do. What does it mean for me, say these wives, to honour Jesus in my marriage when my husband isn't a believer? They're dealing with what one writer has called the chaos of conversion. That writer is a woman called Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. It's a great name wherever you're coming from. And I remember reading a book she'd written a few years ago called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely convert. It tells the fairly dramatic story of how Butterfield herself came to trust in Jesus at the age of 36. And near the beginning of the book, she writes these words. She writes, I sometimes wonder when I hear other Christians pray for the salvation of the lost, if they realise that complicated and comprehensive chaos is the desired end of their prayers. It's vivid language, isn't it? You see, for Rosaria Butterfield, putting her faith in Jesus at the age of 36 turned her whole life upside down. She writes, My life as I knew it became train wrecked at the hands of God. It's vivid language, isn't it? But I believe it's language the Apostle Peter would have agreed with wholeheartedly. I mean, think of Peter's own life for a moment. There he was, he was a fisherman in Galilee in partnership with his brother, probably doing all right financially. He was a strong, self-confident man. He knew his place in the world. And then suddenly, a man called Jesus of Nazareth broke into his life and everything changed. Peter's life was turned upside down. And that was certainly the case for the Christians Peter's writing to in this letter. And in particular, the Christian wives whose husbands don't believe. Each one of these women had gone through the chaos of conversion. Their allegiances had changed. Jesus was now Lord of their lives. But now they said, well, what does that mean for my marriage? What does that mean for my relationship with my husband? These wives would have been asking themselves, well, should I try to convert my husband? Should I preach the gospel at him until he comes to his senses and believes? Am I now doomed to live a double life? Sort of, I'm one person with my church family and I'm another person when I'm at home. Should I even consider leaving my husband if that's an option open to me? So you can imagine the, the struggles these women were having. Am I sort of doomed to be a second class Christian now because my husband doesn't believe? Is Jesus somehow disappointed in me? You see, their situation may have looked hopeless for these wives. But it's against that background of question and struggle that I believe the Apostle Peter has such good news for these wives he's writing to. And more than that, Peter's got good news for any Christian watching this who feels their life is somehow going to stop them living wholeheartedly for Jesus. That somehow their situation in life, the challenges they face, means that somehow Jesus is disappointed in them. 
Far from it, says Peter to these wives and to all of us. Jesus is not disappointed in any of his followers. He is not distant from us. Quite the opposite. Jesus promises to meet with these wives in their marriages in a powerful and life-changing way. He promises to help them live for him. And he promises to help them love their husbands in a way that brings glory to God and which may also result, by God's grace, in their husbands too coming to find life and hope in a relationship with Jesus. So let's listen to what Peter says to these wives here. He speaks to Christian wives in verses 1 to 6. Far more briefly, he speaks to Christian husbands in verse 7. And finally, I want to think again as we finish what this means for all of us, whatever our situation in life. So looking at verses 1 to 6 first, you can sort of summarise Peter's instructions to Christian wives here like this. Wives, follow Jesus in your marriage. Wives, follow Jesus in your marriage. That's verses 1 to 6. Look at verse 1 again for a moment. Wives, in the same way, says Peter, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Again, what does that phrase mean, in the same way? Well, he's referring back to what we looked at in chapter 2 of this letter. Chapter 2, verse 13, submit for the Lord's sake, says Peter. Why should these Christian wives choose to submit themselves to their husbands? The answer is for the Lord's sake, as an act of worship of the Lord Jesus. Now, of course, the elephant in the room, whenever we come to look at a passage like this in 1 Peter, is that Peter's instructions for Christian wives here, well, they just sound offensive to our modern ears. So submit yourselves to your own husbands. Aspire to have the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. So at first hearing, it all sounds like a call for Christian wives to return to some mythical version of the 1950s housewife. Where the wife's sole purpose is to cook the meals, look pretty and agree with her husband. I'm reminded of a classic Harry Enfield sketch from the 90s where the the wife says, well, I don't know much about the gold standard, but I do think kittens are lovely and soft. I mean, is that what Peter is urging Christian wives to become here? Well, I hope you're encouraged to hear. I think the answer is no to that. The reality is actually very, very different. In fact, Peter is calling on Christian wives to play the Jesus role in their marriages, especially if their husbands do not yet believe in Jesus. Wives, he says, follow Jesus in your marriages and learn from him what true submission looks like, what true witness looks like, and what true beauty looks like. First of all, then, learn from Jesus what true submission looks like. Again, that word submission It's one of the last truly dirty words in our culture. Submission, it just sounds so demeaning to our modern ears. In verse 1, Peter says, Christian wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. But actually, that's not a unique command in 1 Peter. Again, cast your mind back to before Christmas and our time in chapter 2 of this letter. You'll remember that Peter actually tells every single Christian he's writing to in this letter to submit themselves for the Lord's sake in some shape or form in their lives. So in 1 Peter 2 verse 13, all Christians are to submit themselves to governing authorities. Chapter 2 verse 18, Christian slaves or servants are to submit themselves to their masters. And now chapter 3 of 1 Peter Christian wives are to submit themselves to their husbands. See, as as uncomfortable as it makes us feel, Peter is insistent in this letter. Submission is a central and unavoidable part of the Christian life, of a life lived with and for Jesus Christ. Why? Well, because we follow and trust in a saviour who submitted himself for us, who submitted himself to his father's will and went to the cross for us, who submitted himself even to his enemies, allowing himself to be crucified so he could free us from our sin. Whenever the Bible tells a Christian to submit, the Bible is urging us to learn from and follow the example of Jesus. The Lord Jesus, he is our great example and model 
of submission. And submission is at the heart of the Christian life because according to Jesus, submission is is at the heart of loving another person. It's at the heart of loving the living God and it's at the heart of loving the people around us. And for the wives he's writing to, it's at the heart of what it means to love their husbands. See again, if a Christian wants to know what love is, we look to Jesus. And again and again, Jesus blows our selfish and sentimental ideas of love clean out of the water. See, according to Jesus, true, genuine love is all about laying down your life for the other person. It's about laying down your desires and your rights for someone else's good. To use the dramatic language Jesus himself uses in the Gospels, love is losing your life in order to find it. It's dying to yourself so that you may truly live. So when Peter calls on these wives to submit themselves to their husbands, he's telling them, Follow Jesus in your marriage and Jesus will show you what true submission looks like. See, according to Jesus, true submission is all about loving and trusting God and loving and serving people. It's about trusting God that whenever we have to lay down our rights, our desires for the other person, God sees that, God honours that, God will reward that. And it's about loving and serving the other person. Saying, I am no longer the most important person. I'm here to love you, to help you, to do you good. That is Christ-like love in any relationship, including the relationship of marriage. You see, Peter urges these wives, learn from Jesus what true submission looks like. And you will be the most powerful witness for Jesus you can be in your marriage. You see, Peter wants these Christian wives to learn from Jesus what true witness looks like. Look at verse 1 again. He says, Submit yourselves to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives. I can remember what these wives would have been wrestling with. So how can I help my husband come to trust in Jesus for himself? And Peter's striking answer is, it's through the way you live for Jesus in your marriage. The way you love and serve your husband in your marriage. That is what will win him over. Actually, the way you live for Jesus is more important than the things you say about Jesus. And in that, actually, Peter is going to apply that to all Christians in our next bit of this letter. Peter's drawing out a principle about sharing the gospel with anyone that applies far beyond the situation these Christian wives are in with their unbelieving husbands. Again, the way we live for Jesus is an even more powerful witness than the things we say about Jesus. A life transformed by Jesus is always the most effective and powerful witness we have to the truth of the gospel. And I notice Peter doesn't say here that the wife should never talk to her husband about the gospel. Again, in a little while, Peter's going to tell all his readers, male and female, married or unmarried, to always be ready to explain the gospel when someone asks them. Look ahead to 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Peter writes, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a message that needs to be shared, that needs to be verbally proclaimed. But, Peter says, before the gospel is proclaimed, it has to be lived out. Peter wants his readers to see that that, that God will win over these unbelieving husbands through how their wives live with them through how their lives demonstrate something of the character and beauty of Jesus. See, this shows us that in any evangelism we do, whether it's a wife to their husband or a friend to another friend, a work colleague to a work colleague, we need to be praying that Jesus is Lord of our lives and that Jesus is changing us more and more into his image. Our lives are the greatest demonstration of the truth of the gospel. And it's through our lives 
that people will then ask us to give the reason for the hope that we have. And then we need to be ready to do that. See, Peter is showing these Christian wives what true witness looks like. It is a life transformed by Jesus and a life made beautiful by Jesus. See, that's the final thing Peter wants to tell these wives. Jesus will show them what true beauty looks like. Look at verses three and four again for a moment. Peter speaking, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Now, again, we need to be careful here. Peter, he isn't forbidding Christian wives from dressing well or looking after themselves. But what he does warn them against is ever believing that beauty is all about how they look or the clothes they wear. True beauty, Peter tells us, is from the inside out. And more than that, true beauty is all about us becoming more and more like Jesus. Now again, looking at verse 4, Peter's words might grate a bit when we first hear them. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Again, on the first hearing, it sounds a bit like that 1950s housewife again. But again, the reality is, Peter's urging these Christian wives to grow more and more like Jesus. The word he uses in the Greek here for gentle, it only occurs three other times in the New Testament. And two of those times, it is describing Jesus. The most striking example comes in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, where Jesus says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. To find out more about that verse, have a look at the remarkable book, Gentle and Lowly, by Dane Ortland, doing the rounds at the minute. You see, Jesus is describing his heart in this verse. And he describes it as gentle and humble. So when Peter urges Christian wives to aspire to that gentle and quiet spirit, what he's actually doing is learn from Jesus. Ask Jesus to change you. Ask Jesus to make you more like him in your marriage. And then you will be displaying what true beauty looks like in a way that brings glory to God, in a way that might impact your husband to trust in Jesus, and a way that demonstrate Jesus' character to the world around you. A gentle and quiet spirit is a spirit like Jesus. Christian wives are to aspire to that, but also you step back to the whole of scripture. Every believer is to aspire to that. I hope we can see here, it is a gloriously high calling Peter places on these Christian wives. And far from being a second class Christian because of their the spiritual state of their husbands, actually these wives are being called to a deeper knowledge of Jesus to display his glory and beauty through their lives. Wives, says Peter, follow Jesus in your marriages and he will change you. He will meet with you. He will transform you. Now we've said that the majority of this passage is Peter writing to Christian wives. There's only one verse actually where he mentions husbands, that's verse 7. Again, why is that? Various commentators make guesses. It seems most likely that I guess there were more Christian wives, more Christian women in the churches Peter's writing to than Christian husbands and men. But I don't want to leave without saying something about verse 7 here because it has important things to say both to husbands, to wives and indeed to all of us. Again, we could summarise verse 7 with Peter saying something very similar to what he says to Christian wives. Husbands, he says, follow Jesus in your marriage, verse 7. I mean, look at verse 7 again. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Literally, Live together according to knowledge. See, what Peter is calling on Christian husbands to do here is to understand 
their wives. Peter's asking a very simple but life-changing question here. Husband, how well do you know your wife? Do you take the time to listen to her? Do you talk to her? Do you know what her passions are in life? Do you know what her struggles are in life? See, if you're going to be able to love and lead your wife in a Christ-like way, you need to take the time to understand her. Now, one of the cheesiest lines in movie history is one that's always stuck with me from the movie Titanic. The old lady says at the end of that movie, a woman's heart is a deep ocean of secrets. It's really cheesy. It was written and scripted by the director, James Cameron, who has been married five times. So he knows quite a bit about secrets in marriage. But actually what Peter's saying here is live together according to knowledge. Go after your wife's heart. Get to know her. And then you will know how to love her in the Christ-like way you're called to do. Then, Peter urges them, you're ready to honour her. Honour your wife, Peter says. Again, verse 7, Peter describes Christian wives in two ways. The first of which sounds really offensive to our modern ears. Probably wouldn't have been controversial in the first century. And the second would probably have astonished readers in the first century. And should astonish us and lead us to praise and thanksgiving today. See, Peter describes the wife in verse 7 as the weaker partner, literally a weaker vessel, and also as heirs with you or co-heirs of the gracious gift of life. Now, taking that first description first, what does Peter mean by describing the wife as the weaker vessel? Well, as offensive as that sounds at first, I don't believe Peter's making a moral or spiritual judgment here. In fact, by using the word for vessel in the original Greek, Peter's showing us he's referring to our physical bodies. And again, notice that by calling the wife the weaker vessel, he's also describing the husband as a vessel too. Now, Peter isn't saying that wives are somehow spiritually weaker or emotionally weaker or even morally weaker than their husbands. No, Peter's simply describing physical reality in the vast majority of marriages. So in the vast majority of marriages, the husband is physically stronger than the wife. Peter acknowledges that here and then he urges Christian husbands, never abuse your physical strength. Never dominate your wife. Instead, honour her. Why? Well, Peter tells us because she is an heir with you, a co-heir of the gracious gift of life. Again, in the first century world, women were often overlooked when it came to inheritance. The person who inherited a family's wealth, the heir, was in the vast majority of cases the son rather than the daughter, a man rather than a woman. But can you hear what Peter is telling Christian husbands here? That is not the case in the family of God. Christian men and women are co-heirs together of the gracious gift of life. They will both enter into eternity, into a glorious new creation through their faith in Jesus. So husbands, your wives are co-heirs with you of the gift of life, therefore honour them. And Peter's parting shot to husbands, pray with your wife. Again, a Christian husband is to understand and honour his wife, Peter says, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Do you see this fascinating statement? According to Peter here, God is so concerned that Christian husbands live in an understanding and loving way with their wives that God will not listen to a husband's prayers if the husband's not doing that. See, Peter says the stakes are so high here. Your spiritual life, husband, your relationship with the God of grace depends on how well you're seeking to understand, honour and serve your wife. So learn from Jesus how to do that. Ask Jesus to help you in that. Stay close to Jesus. Follow Jesus in your marriage, says Peter. We began our time in this passage today by reminding ourselves marriage in the Bible, it is always a signpost to the eternal passionate and committed love Jesus Christ has for his bride, the church. The particular focus of this passage in Peter, at least the first few verses, is on Christian wives who are married to unbelieving husbands. 
But I want to finish our time in this passage with a word of encouragement for every Christian watching this today, whether you are married or not. Again, remember when we tried to imagine what it would mean like for these Christian wives in the churches Peter's writing to. See, like those wives, maybe you look at your life and you think that the circumstances of your life right now are just so difficult and discouraging. You may worry that your life has gone in the wrong direction. You may question whether Jesus is really able to meet with you and help you live for him when things just feel so difficult and draining right now. Well, if that is how you're feeling today, I want to encourage you from this passage in 1 Peter. Jesus is able and willing to meet with anyone, whatever their circumstances in life, if they will only come to him. And our only qualification for coming to Jesus is admitting we need him to save us. Once we admit that, Jesus will do the rest. None of us are second-class Christians if we are trusting in Jesus. You may be experiencing real difficulty in your life. It may be in your marriage. It may be in your family life. It may be in your work or lack of work. It may just be living through a winter like the one we're all living through. But you see, Jesus is able and willing to meet with you if you will only come to him. Think again of that beauty Peter describes in this passage, the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That is the beauty of Jesus. That is a Jesus who will not drive us away, but a Jesus who welcomes us to cry out to him. And then he will come and eat with us and meet with us. That these are the words Jesus says to weary and struggling people. Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Whatever the circumstances of your life right now, come to Jesus. Learn from Jesus. Walk with Jesus. And he promises that if we do that, we will find the strength we need and we will ultimately find rest for our souls. Praise God for the grace of our great Saviour. 